Hey, Joe, welcome to the High Performance Zone. It's so good to be back together again. How are you yeah, feeling? It's good, it's good to be with, with you again. I know if we were in the same room, we'd, we'd be doing the high five and the hug. So uh, this, this is good enough. Yeah, what do you call that? There's something energy. When we were together, you, you, you had a word for it. I forget the word I used, but the minute you entered that room, uh, you energized me and you energized everybody else. And, uh, and, you know, and it's one of those things that we forget that, uh, that energy is contagious nice. and you can take it the other way, but you know, when you're training, um, you take it to that level where everybody wanted to be there. Nobody wanted to leave. The energy was so high in the room. And I, and, and that's part of it. The other part of it was you have created this love of learning with, with an institution. And I, I think I can make them uh, mention yeah. them, right? Yeah, please, please let, let, let the audience CH, know. Yeah, no, we were both at CHG, wonderful organization, fantastic people. But I, you know, like you, I go around the world and not every organization, when you sit down, has this love of learning you've created, yeah. you know, and, and of course the, the folks there, have created this love of learning where everybody looked forward to being there to eager to learn. And, and I think that makes a big difference with organizations with, uh, retaining your valuable, um, uh, uh, staff and, uh, and creating a skill set that they can take one generation to another as they're getting ready to retire. They yes. can teach these uh, things to others. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's such an insightful leader so that everybody knows we're talking about community health group in San Diego. Joe and I were put there together. Uh, Joe, I do a weekly training with their leadership and all their uh, directors, about you know, 50, 60 people. And we had the rare privilege. Joe, you came in and gave an incredible presentation about nonverbal communication, but really leadership and communication as a whole. So I was thinking, let's unpack some of that, right? Uh, and I think the, the one thing that you nailed was this idea of the love of learning. Uh, as I was watching you, as you were inter integrating with the whole audience, uh, mm -hmm. and there were so many questions and such profound ahas. So for everybody knows on this, this one, uh, we could go many directions, but as I said in my introduction, you know, Joe is an expert, probably the world's expert on nonverbal communication, but I would even say communication as a whole, right? And you've written so many books, uh, some of them still the number one bestseller on nonverbal communication. So I was thinking as a whole, let's do this. I, I want to dive into just at a high level um, where you became an expert and what do we mean by nonverbal communication. And then we're going to get really detailed. We're going to dive into, uh, so everybody walks away from this with some real techniques uh, of how to uh, increase your own leadership, your own awareness. But when we talk about it, it's such a big topic, Joe. How do you describe nonverbal communication? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a big, it's a huge uh, area because for me, nonverbal communication is really anything that communicates uh, but it's not a word. When you used to wear your uniform, nice. uh, how you, how you walked on that flight line, how even how you boarded the aircraft. Yes, there's you know you you see amateurs, and then you see you know the Blue Angels, and and uh, and you see the the difference in little things that are not spoken, mm -hmm. but speak volumes. And, um, and so for me, you know, studying the first language, uh, which is really body language, it's, uh, you know, the minute we're born, we're hugging, we're touching, we're kissing, we're caressing and so forth. And throughout our lives, we use nonverbals to convey that we're honest, to convey uh, trustworthiness, to to convey uh, uh, leadership. Uh, and so uh, for me, early on, it was important, especially uh, in the FBI, to bring this together because a lot of what we did in the FBI as a special agent is observe people. We are constantly observing each other. You know, obviously, you're observing for uh, criminal activity, but you're also in a room talking to maybe a, a mafia member or a foreign spy 
And we're looking for that little nuance that mm -hmm. says um, there's a chink in the armor or there's a weakness here and and, and so forth. So uh, for me, it was it was essential uh, in, uh, in 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 law enforcement. And I came to it quite by accident because I came to America uh, from Cuba right after the revolution. And so not speaking wow. English, I resorted to the only language that really uh was truly honest and that was uh body language wow joe you just you just set a high bar for us so thanks again on the the big idea of what is body language nonverbal? Uh, i loved your analogy on the blue angels and we were very conscious of that uh inside the briefing debriefing room there was a door it was closed it had a sign on it said blue angels only and believe me i don't care if you're the base commander you're not walking in that room okay unless you're right. invited right but um and and we did that in per on purpose so that we could relax behind the scenes but when we were in front of the crowd you know those little nuances meant a lot how your uniform was what pen was it was in in the right order your autograph pen versus your note-taking pen um everything being buttoned up uh because people are watching just what you said you know you're 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 telling a story by the way yeah. you come into a room so uh tell me more about uh and i can't wait to get into your fbi training but yeah. um what do you observe now what is your technique when you're yeah. in a business setting uh what are you observing yeah. And by the way, we're not just, a, uh, you know, the the uniform, the, the way you walk in as a both as a, uh, a blue angel or myself. You know, we we had the the, the stereotypical FBI uniform, navy blue right. suit, the, the white shirt. But there's an expectation. But but there's a higher purpose. And, yes. and the fact is you're actually influencing people. Think about how many people joined the Air Force because they saw a pilot uh getting into uh, uh, a delta airline flight or, or maybe they went out to an air show and got to see uh you know the the elite groups and uh, and so forth we forget that we are often influencing uh, e each other and in the bureau of course we were looking uh, for certain things in the private sector i found it it doesn't really change that an executive who can exude uh, confidence without looking arrogant, yep. who can, through the way they uh, ask questions, timely questions, uh, indicate that uh, time does matter, that some things need to be asked in the here and now, and that delay uh, causes problems. Um, that who can Give me an example right there. That's a big one. Give me an example oh. in the real world. It's 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 a huge one. It's oftentimes there are there are issues going on in the company and they wait too long to ask the right questions when the questions need to be asked in the moment. Yeah. Speed of reaction equates to your capacity as a leader. That if you see, you know, whether you're looking at Alexander the Great or Napoleon, that when you start to see things are not going right, there is no hesitation. You have to jump in and head things off. And a lot of times uh, we can do that as leaders by asking the, the best question. And that is, are we doing it right? Is there a better way? Should we have done it differently? Can we can we change and pivot and so forth? The other thing that 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 we forget, and it's one of the nonverbals uh, of of leadership, is that part of leadership is to uh, to deal with the fears, the apprehensions, and the concerns of other. I I always remark on Eisenhower meeting with the the airborne troops right before they were going to jump at Normandy. And that was, you know, he wasn't going to affect their training, but he was there to affect their fears and their concerns. And he didn't have to give a pep talk. He would just chummy like talk to them. And that is, in fact, a nonverbal to walk amongst the troops, to yes. let them know that you're part of them, to through your own body language, say, you know, we're going to make it through this. Yeah. Uh, with, without having to say a word. Well, I think what you're showing there, and I didn't even know Eisenhower, uh, I, I, was, I wasn't aware of what speech he gave at that moment, but you're right about, he showed he cared, right? And I think leadership is about caring. And, and there's different ways to show that. 
right? And I loved your analogy about just having a conversation. I don't know much about the agency, right? Mm -hmm. And that you spent 25 years uh, in behavioral science, right? Uh, tell it. Tell me a little bit. Tell us a little bit about yeah. what did you do and and what did you learn? How did how did you use this? You know, it's one of those things where um, the for whatever the reason the the bureau approached me. Uh, I was still at Brigham Young University, okay. um, and they said we'd we'd like for you to join. And uh, why do you think they picked you? Why did they source you out? Did you volunteer? We, or did they find I you? never figured that out. I, I know that for a fact that uh, they had people uh, recruiting at different universities. Okay. Um, NSA, for instance, uh, recruits a lot at, uh, at BYU because a lot of the missionaries come back with, uh, wow. with languages and, and, and so forth. And somebody had given me up and I'm grateful for it because... Um, you know, I, I, I was, came in the bureau and, um, and immediately was assigned to Phoenix where most of the cases I worked were uh, crime on government and Indian reservations. So I did a lot of homicides. I did rapes and, and things like that. And, uh, you know, so you learn to do good crime scene work and testifying in court, all the basics that you're going to need. And then all of a sudden I, I, end up in New York, where now it's in the middle, it's at the tail end of the Cold War. It's uh, now 1981, 82, and we're fighting the Soviets. And it's us against the Russians and the Hungarians and the East German intelligence services. Um, and, you know, at that time, the, the, the Russian mission to the United Nations, 85 percent of the people there were actual spies. So wow. uh, they kept us busy. And um, and so counterintelligence uh, really became what I worked for the rest of my life. Um, and then somewhere along the line, and, you know, there's always somebody that hands you up. Uh, somebody, uh, you know, I, I I think I told you when we were at CHG that uh, I had a pilot's license. So I flew surveillance for the bureau and then I was on the SWAT team and 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 all that. Um, but then I went into the behavioral program, which was specifically yeah. created to look at, um, at, at human behavior um, for intelligence purposes. And then I spent 15 years in, in, in that unit. And uh, in many ways, just as uh, you do um, and, and Rob does, um, it, it was a lot of training, constant training in, uh, you know, what makes us humans? How do we react to things? Um, why do some people go bad? And, uh, you know, how to detect deception and do this and do that. And my expertise then became uh, uh, body language and, uh, and, and interviewing. You know, I was, I was proud of the work that we all did. Uh, you know, it was very challenging times. And, and obviously, in the end, we were dealing with 9-11 uh, um, and, and, um, and, and all of that. But what I learned uh, was the invaluable skills of getting people to open up that most of the work that we did in the FBI was talking to people, recruiting people, getting people to tell us things that they wouldn't tell anybody else, and uh, and uh, showing uh, leadership skills. Uh, because when when you're trying to recruit somebody that is placing their life in your hands, you have to demonstrate to them. You can't just say it that they can trust you, that they can put their lives in in in, in your hands. And I've and I've recruited recruited intelligence officers from from other countries. And it's quite something when someone says, here, I'm putting my life and that of my wife and my children in your hands, and I trust you. You Those things you, you cannot teach, those things you can't say. It is demonstrative. And I, and I think, you know, you and I are on the same page on that, is what, what are we demonstrating day in and day out? Well, I'm glad you hit the trust at that deep level, you know, uh, as you know, on the blues, you do put your life in the other person's hands. Um, but in, in the military as a whole, but not always in, in every role in the FBI, I, I just I got goosebumps as you were talking about a foreign intelligence officer putting they, they literally are putting their life and, and their family's lives in, in your hand. Uh, how did you 
develop that trust? Uh, what was it that you did? I paid attention to all the all, all, all the good guys before me that demonstrated those skills. Uh, you know, you find that it wasn't the strongest guys, the fastest guys. It was really about the people that had people skills that uh, were humble and that uh, were truly empathetic, that were willing to fight with the administration and uh, and say, no, this person deserves this and that. And uh, and they know when when you are coming to to their defense. And, and I think I think good leaders uh, do that. They demonstrably um, show through their actions, as subtle as they may be every day who they are and uh, and that they can be uh, that they can be trusted yeah to me the uh, the glad to be here we'll get more into it but it is a combination of excellence at what you do i, I love what you talked about you learn from others right you observe who's doing it well uh, yeah. and caring right this empathy this ability to to care about and the nuance is it's not just yourself i mean we can be uh good at what we do and we can care about ourselves, but the harder thing is, can you care about others or purpose higher than self at that same level? The Bureau, you know, you're doing it for the nation, right? You're uh, same thing that I was. Um, give me one attribute that you saw in those people who demonstrated that. What was the energy like uh, when you were around them? How did you, how did you know? In a crisis, Right. Mm -hmm. I remember my first big case, uh, Yuma, Arizona, uh, a nine year old boy is abducted uh, going through a neighborhood and he's uh, kidnapped. Um, turns out he was riding through a rich neighborhood. <laughs> the kidnappers thought he lived there. He's actually. Ah. So, you know, now now we're, we're we're dealing with that. And what I realize that when everything is going OK, um, you see a certain kind of leadership, but when things are really bad, when when the bad guy gets on the phone, this is this is before cell phones. So you get a payphone call, and the guy says, "You have four hours to have the money ready, or the uh, the child dies." Um, it is during those crucial, uh, high stake situations that you realize. Um, who keeps their calm, mm. who keeps thinking. That's one of the things that I was shocked at, how often um, good thinking shunts down mm. and the people go into, you know, uh, an, an emotive mode where they're really not thinking about things and say, wait a minute, you know, what do we train for? What is it? What What is our, our responsibility? And I, uh, I'll never forget. I, I know you'll like this story. And the uh, the um, the agent in charge said, this is Yuma, Arizona. How many pay phones can they possibly have? And within an hour, he flew 100 agents into oh. the city and had one agent within 30 seconds of every pay phone. And I thought to myself, who thinks at that level? Who thinks at that level? And uh, we caught the guys. We wow. caught the guys on their uh, when they made their 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 third call. And it was that that really. Uh, sh I mean, you read about these uh, these uh, individuals, but to be in the presence of them, mm -hmm. and I and I'm sure that in in your situations, I know that in your situations, you know when. <laughs> When the engines aren't working well, when everything's not, uh, you know, that's when you really have to, you either rise to the occasion or you sink. Yeah, I love the idea of this calm under pressure. You know, that's what I hear you saying. And not everybody has that, but you sure can see it, right? Um, and I think in my background, you could tell the difference between what I call a warrior leader. That was somebody, I use the word warrior, that stepped up just like you did. They're calm, they're thinking. Um, or you have an administrative leader who looks great when everything's going well. And yeah. when, the sh when the shit hits the fan, you, you know what I notice is they get real quiet. They don't know what to do. 
and uh, and or they make bad decisions, right? They kind of the the freeze mode. What about this? I want to I want to say yes to that, but I also I'm super intrigued on your skills of observation. You know, mm-hmm. this idea of let's let's get to some of the physical skills. You taught this at CHG. There's nuances, right? That you can pick up in people. You do it at a, probably a, a rate of t- thousand times better than most of us. But what can you teach us about observation that you've noticed in people? And what, what should I do to Yeah, well, activities? you were in on that, well, on that yeah. lesson. I think it was an eye opener that we are constantly transmitting that everything from uh, the color of our, our skin, our skin may blush, um, the contraction of the lips because we may be stressed about something or we want to say something, but we're not given the opportunity that the frequency of how often we touch our face that uh, something so simple as, Hey, I'm pondering what to do. You go from, from pondering something to all of a sudden you're scratching your face means that something is stressing you uh, um, uh, even more that, uh, right. You know, your shoulders may raise, uh, in a, in a board meeting as they're going around saying, well, what have you done for the organization today? And you're trying to hide like a turtle. Yeah. Um, and these subtle things manifest in real time, including, uh, you know, people say, well, uh, any area of the body. And I say the feet are probably some of the most accurate, um, wow. uh, tells, that we have notice how often uh when we when we get happy about something we get happy feet or when we welcome oh. want to welcome someone let's say you and i are talking and and this happened because this, i remember this the uh, ceo graced uh graced us with of uh chg with uh with his presence uh, while we were there yes and you didn't notice it but i noticed it in in you you immediately uh, widen your feet at 45 degrees to welcome. And that's actually how we welcome each other. It's not that we rotate at the hips and say, hi, join us. It's when the feet move that we are actually welcoming other people and that the brain subconsciously uh, uh, picks things up. Uh, look at the gestures of the leader. The 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 gestures of the leader are broad but smooth versus uh, uh, what we often see with someone of of lower uh, rank. You know, I I often use the the example that uh, for for safety reasons um, against snipers. If if you in a field uniform, if you put a general and a private next to each other oh. from the back, you can tell who the general is by just the way they walk. Wow. The uniform looks the same. I mean, when you're downrange, the uniforms are, are, are the same from the from the rear, but how they carry themselves. And so how we enter a room, how we make eye contact with each and every individual, those things are uh, I- I- invaluable. Um, and, and even something uh, a- as subtle as Somebody asks a question, and then before we answer, we we pull on our collar, right? A ventilating behavior. They go, wait ah. a minute, why why are you ventilating to answer the question? Well, you know, we've had problems uh, with with the hardware uh, getting here on time. Well, why didn't you say so? Well, they actually did. Wow. So these uh, these little gestures, these little behaviors, um, reveal and in in real time what we are experiencing and as you know because you were there for for the the whole event you know yes. this isn't about catching people this isn't about detecting deception this is about the day-to-day communications and what we can infer from this information that uh, that is being uh, uh, brought out. Well, Joe, you're such an expert on this. You've written so many books, and I, I got to experience you real time, right? It's not the, the classic, oh, you can tell if someone's lying if they look left or whatever that is. You know, I, I just made that up, right. by the way. I want, I want you to, to give us more of a, a sense of... Um, we're talking about presence, executive presence, your presence. Uh, I, I got to be honest with you, nobody taught me 
what you are able to teach. You know, I never went through a class that said, hey, if you want to be confident, do this. But I observed it, right? And I, you know, I saw it in leaders. I saw it in team captains of sports teams and certain coaches, my certain leaders, certain business leaders. It's such a great power to be able to observe. Uh, and I think what you add is, is you can bring years of this observation to, okay, here's some tendencies that I'm tending to like ventilation. I, I never knew about that. The happy feet. I had no idea. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if, if you, uh, so are there other, let's first do this. Let's go to, let's dispel any things that you know are, are maybe not true, you know, that we may have heard, like if a person looks up when they're answering a question, they're lying. Yeah. I don't know. I made that up. Right. But let's just dispel a couple and then let's get yeah. to what have you learned? Uh, well, there's a lot of myths out there. Yeah, myths. Uh, one of the myths is, is, is if a person uh, hears a question, looks up to the left and then uh, looks to the right. Uh, look, there's been 27 studies that have looked at this. David Matsumoto, University of San Francisco, um, writes about this at length. The fact is, is that most of us, as we hear information or are processing that information, we may look in different uh, directions. Um, and that's really all that we can say. One of the interesting things from the research is that people say, well, you know, if you look away, then you're, uh, then you're lying. The fact of the matter is, is liars actually engage in more <laughs> eye contact because they want to make sure that, uh, that, that they're believed. But there's all sorts of myths that, you know, if you're sitting comfortably with your arms uh, crossed, that uh, this is somehow a blocking behavior, when in fact, this is a very comforting behavior. Wow. It is, uh, it is uh, in essence, a, uh, a self-hug. Um, and there's and there's a lot of myths out there. When I when I first came into law enforcement, uh, I remember the, somebody uh, saying, you know, if, if somebody touches their nose while they're answering, they're they're being uh, deceptive. And, um, you know, hopefully by now we've we've gotten away from that. What I look what I look for is, um, you know, are we communicating effectively Number one. Number two, is there any topic that we're talking about which in some way causes psychological uh, discomfort? Well, and oftentimes in an organization, um, you know, you may, uh, I was in a meeting two weeks ago and um, the, the, the CEO uh, referred to one of the guys and he said, uh, have you heard from SNS uh, shipping company? And um, and the guy immediately tucked his chin down and um, and, uh, you know, compressed his lips. And I, I knew where the answer was going to go. <laughs> right. And he said, uh, boss, I, I can't get him to answer my calls. Right. And so we use the the nonverbals to sort of stay on top of, well, what are the issues? What are what are the concerns? How can I help out? And uh and uh, and things like that in an age where we th most of us are on uh, some sort of digital device yeah one of the big messages uh that we talked about you and i talked about when we were there is that we must not forget that the most powerful way that we have to both communicate and influence remains nonverbal. that when you put your arm around a, a buddy and say look you'll do it right next time that uh, things will get better, that um, we're in it together. Nothing communicates that uh, like uh, nonverbals. Wow. Let's go uh, again on your research. And then I want to dive into the Blue Angel uh, story because <laughs> your perspective, you've seen the movie and yeah. uh, we could really pull out some really, I think, unique things between the two of us. But just to wrap up kind of the, the myths, but more importantly, the power of nonverbal. So first off, what is, I've heard it's 63% nonverbal communication. I, I don't know if those numbers are accurate, but what, what does your study show you between nonverbal, verbal, and written communication? I, I've seen all sorts of numbers yeah. and nobody knows where they came from. Here's, here's my best take after studying this since 1971. Nobody knows. 
because you can be silently uh, looking at your future spouse in a cafe not and say not one word and you are communicating 100 percent non-verbally nice. and it's effectively and i often see uh you know uh, older couples they sit in a car they don't talk but they're in complete harmony i think it wow. has to do more with context obviously if you're in an engineer's meeting it's going to be uh uh more uh of the verbal among engineers we know that the nonverbals is still high because you have cultures, for instance, that are very nuanced. Uh, if you go to Japan, if you go to China, um, these are cultures, uh, as uh, uh, General MacArthur did, who took anthropologists with him and taught him, you know, how you bow, how you greet. All these things will make your life easier during the occupation. And so I always say it's... It's extremely high. I would put it at least in the 70 to 80 percent range because of the amount of information that the subconscious is constantly collecting. And, and I think that's that still remains. Um, but, it, you know, as as we were in that we were in that meeting, think about how uh, people reacted to each other by where they sat. Yes. Um, the the amount of uh, uh, congeniality, friendship, uh, the hugging, yeah. uh, all of this. You know, if you ask me how much of that meeting was nonverbal, I'd say a lot. <laughs> it, it, it was a lot. And I think that's what that contributes to the to the to the beauty of it. Wow. You made me think of a word. I'm going to use this word energy. And, uh, you know, uh, you you talked about when I walked in the room, when you see people walk in, there's a there's I would almost say an energy. Yes, there's nonverbal cues, too. But uh, what do you think about energy? You know how they, they say people have an intuition? you know, about somebody, you can, you can have an intuition about someone. Where does energy play in this discussion? That's a great question, but I see it two ways. One is I see the energy that we bring into something and we see it in, like you said, with coaches, with good leaders, with, um, with yourself. I, I, I felt I, the minute you entered, I was sitting down and uh, working on the computer doing something, but the minute you entered the, the energy changed. And so I th I see that as separate and apart from intuition. Intuition really is to me is nothing more than your subconscious being able to process so much information. And we know that we know that from the work of uh, Doctor Ambadi at Harvard, who says that we are uh, assessing each other in as little as three milliseconds. That's wow. faster than you can blink that you can walk into a room and just take a peek and watch a teacher for less than five seconds. And you will rate that teacher the same way as a student who had been in class all semester long, wow. just from about five seconds of observation. So what we perceive as intuition is in fact, we have relaxed our brain enough to allow it to analyze the world and not put barriers against it yes. and say, you know what? I have a gut feeling that maybe I shouldn't go in there, that I shouldn't uh, enter into this room, that I shouldn't get into that elevator. And and I have to tell you, from my perspective, it's it's saved my life um, well, uh, on several example. occasions. Well, give me an example where you trusted that and it saved your life. There was... Uh, we 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 had been looking for this uh, this uh, fugitive for a while. We knew he was in a in a in a vast area, and uh, and there was a you know and and there was a shed there. And somebody uh, over the radio said, "Oh no, we've already looked in there." And they were actually talking about another shed that I didn't see, and just I'm about. A hundred feet away from it, my weapon is out, and something is telling me, don't get any closer. Wow. Uh, one of the things that you're taught in law enforcement is distance is your friend. Most people are not good shooters, and uh, if you uh, you know have to uh, run, then it, it makes it easier. 
And just something said to me, don't go any closer. To make a long story short, the guy was sitting there watching me, tracking me. And he said, wow. I had you in my sights the whole time. Now, I didn't see him. Right. And I was listening to what somebody else had said. Yeah, don't worry about it. We've 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 already cleared it. But th but there's there's something about you know maybe the the door was a little bit too ajar. Maybe there there was grass that had been trampled on. I don't know. But the subconscious picked up on it. And I wow. tell this to uh, uh, you know people going off to college for the first time, yes. men men and women everywhere. Listen to your gut. Um, we know that we have neurons, uh, in our gut, uh, we have neurons in our heart, uh, they're connected by the vagus nerve. And if you feel that tightness, um, you know, stay away, stay away. And, um, wow. Beautiful, be uh, recommendation because I was thinking about, you know, how many people uh, could avoid, uh, bad situations by just being aware and trusting. So, Thank you for that. I got emotional just thinking about. Well, it's, you know, it's you, you think about how many people have walked away from situations. Young lady who said, no, I'm not going to get in that car. Exactly. Um, something about that, uh, that car that says Uber, but maybe the sign looked wrong and, and right. so forth. But now I've got a question for you. Oh, yeah, good. OK, let's because, take it. Uh, you know, I, 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 I've watched now the movie twice. Nice. And, uh, let's make sure we talk about the right movie. The blue angels, right? The um, blue yeah. angels, Amazon the Prime. blue angels, yes. which the first time I watched it was for enjoyment. The second yeah. time I watched it was for teaching purposes. Wow. And one of the things that, uh, struck me is you're going so fast your your wings are inches apart uh they're not even meters apart right how do you correct <laughs> uh. or when you sense that uh something may be going wrong when we're talking about hundreds or thousands of a second that yeah. um factor in Wow, wow, such a good question. What went through my mind was two things you said earlier. One is um, we do have processes. We fly within a three inch circle on the other airplane. So if I'm tucked in underneath the wingtip of one of my teammates, I'm actually, we're overlapped. You know, when you think about 18 inches to 12 inches, that's not side by side, that's underneath. So my canopy is 18 inches from the wingtip of another jet and it's moving. You know, that's the other thing you saw is, is there's constant movement, right? right? So what we do is we have a three inch circle. We say fly within the circle that's um, that actually has three three reference points. Cause if you only have two, you, you can have a problem. So three reference right. points, um, I'm up underneath the wing. I'm looking at, they paint the word Boeing in a certain location on the jet. So I'm flying letters on another airplane or even rivets, uh, but yeah. I also need to look across. So anyway, my point is that I, I, I'm allowing me to move but within a certain a certain area, we like to say three inches. Now, when we're learning, it's got to be bigger than that because you just oh, yeah. can't physically do it. But while that, while I say that, that's absolutely accurate. But you mentioned something about your intuition. See, you're picking up all these nonverbal clues too. Your your mind is operating at a much higher speed than you and I can even talk. Right? You're and. You know, am I in a dive? Am I coming up? Is the ground coming up faster than I normally expect it to come up? Um, is there turbulence in the air? Uh, is is my teammate having a bad day? I mean, you know it. You can hear it in their voice, by the way. That's what I pick up first. Um, so all these factors are really what's playing into how I respond. Like, um, And what we've realized in the team is because it is about six jets flying together. If one person's having a bad day, we don't say suck it up and let's all keep flying the same way. We ease it out because we're a team, right? If one person, yeah. and then when that person settles down and you can tell, then you bring it back in. So I think it's part of your training, but you'll have to tell me, uh, that's why experience matters. 
uh, even having one extra year on the team, I could be an F-18 pilot, thousands of hours, be an instructor pilot, Top Gun, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that, that shows a certain level of expertise, but demo flying is a whole different world. So every, every time, even one extra flight, but if you have hundreds of extra flights for some reason, and Joe, why is this? You, your ability to pick up those clues and take appropriate action, which I think is the definition of experience, picking up clues and take appropriate action is just so much faster. Why is that? It is. And I, and I think a, 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 a neurobiologist would say you have experienced the magic of mm -hmm. what, what is called myelination and myelination. Oh, myelination is the strengthening of the synapses between neurons and oh. so the more experience you have right i, re I remember an f4 pilot in yuma arizona the yeah. demonstration came in and he says i fly for a living those guys work for a living <laughs> and uh and uh, so the, the like you said when you start out with that bigger circle that myelination process begins and what happens is that over time now you're taking that from uh, maybe a, a, a ball that's this big to now you got it down to to uh, to three inches. And that gives you a certain amount of security that would have been impossible. The only right. way to achieve that is through this myelination process, which is through practice, repetition. Um, we know that you can actually even myelinate um Visually? by by thinking yes. about okay i'm going to sit in the cockpit i'm going to start the engine this way i'm going to do this and just visualizing what you're going to do um which when we talk to leaders and and we say you know what have you done to to do exactly that to go from this is my safety zone to now this, what I can achieve at this level looks so much better. It's so much more enticing. It's so much more powerful, but you can't go from here to here without paying that, that high price. And that is repetition. It is calling each other out on, hey, on that turn, you need to be tighter or what, whatever. As that one pilot said, that's hard work. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, I'm glad. Let's 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 dive into the, the movie a little more. But I, I want to respond real quick. Is that uh, you know, like you and I give thousands of presentations. I, I I don't even know how many I've given, but I'm sure it's in the three thousand range. But in reality, I've given probably over ten thousand because it's not the presentation. It's what I did in the briefing call as I was trying to put the presentation together. It's the number of times I've rehearsed it in my mind on the airplane flying out there. The morning, every morning I've learned, and you saw it on the Blue Angels movie, yeah. the briefing, we pull each other together. I've turned that into my personal life. I do that every time, religiously. And then I debrief afterwards, religiously. So you take one evolution, mm -hmm. I've probably flown it five or six or seven times in my mind. Yeah. Right. Um, but you see, the, the, this this practice, it, it, you and I see this as well. This is part of of doing things correctly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You, we prepare, we execute. Yep. And then we do the evaluation. Yes. So few people do that. Wow. And then they're stuck. They they they're stuck and they 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 can't get past that. They, they want to perform at a different level, but, uh, you know, it's like, well, how much did you put into a head ahead of time? You knew there was going to be a meeting. Let's say you're, a, you're in mid management. How much yep. did you put into that meeting that was scheduled? Yep. And, and then when it was over, did you ask yourself, well, how was it? And how did you do? Could I could I have used different words? Could I have interjected myself at different points? Could I have been more concise? Here's the trend that's that's happening. Years ago, you know, you had a meeting, and you know, you might be able to get away with an hour of conversation and so forth. A lot of meetings now, um, you're you're literally given uh, seven minutes each. Yep. Why? 
because if, if you got 10 people on the team, that's 70 minutes. We don't have yep. 70 minutes. Yep. Um, and so the, the, the preparation, but the, the post event, um, uh, Debrief. Uh, interviews and so forth. Um, where do the, you see Joe, where do you yep. see the biggest gap? Everything you just said was so beautiful. This idea of preparation, I call that the brief, this idea of execution and this idea of a debrief or a review. Where do you yep. see the biggest gap in corporations and people? The the biggest gap, uh, it, it, it precisely in those, in those two areas yeah. Yeah. is in the proper presentation. What, okay. what kind of slides am I going to use? What what a, you know, who's in attendance, who is going to be there? Do they know this? Do they know the terms of art? Um, is it going to be mostly visual or is it, you know, uh, all, all the things that go into that and then post event. Yes. Um, it's how are we going to do it, uh, better next time? And, and, and what can I personally, cause it's, it's very easy to point fingers right. and say, Oh, you know, what's his name? He talks too much or yeah. whatever. No, 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 no. This is, this is about me. What can I do to, to, to make it better? One of the things that I really enjoyed about the movie and, and it just, it just goes to show the dedication of, uh, of these, uh, like yourself, these valiant uh, pilots. Because these machines are, people can't fathom the speed that they're going at. You know, if, if you start to get nervous at 86 miles an hour, <laughs> that's, that's a fast taxi in one of these things. Exactly. Uh, what got me was the the dedication to perfection, oh, nice. and I almost I almost hear people object to perfection. Well, well, that ah. that's beyond me. Why why would I strive for perfection? My answer is why not? Yeah. Well, how why, about Lombardi? Why, why, Lombardi's got a, a good quote. I'm with you. He says, if we strive for perfection, we may reach excellence along the way. But I'm like you. Why not? I mean, you got to set your sights pretty far. If you know how the brain works and the, mm -hmm. the, the brain works on novelty and the brain works on resilience and the more resilient you make it, right? Your first week of practice is not like the ninth week of practice. Right. Right. Your brain builds up on that. It is extremely plastic. We now know that that, uh, like for instance, the the hippocampus can can grow and so forth. With that, we can myelinate uh, these uh, these uh, synapses. Why not strive for better? Um, and and maybe it has nothing to do with what you're doing currently but right. it may impact uh, on your home life or in other things that you may be, may be doing. And think about the example that you set. Before we go there, I want to do that because that's important. But mastery, I hear you talking about mastery, right? And it doesn't, I, I heard you say, it may be in flying, okay, great. Uh, but what I'm really learning is how to be a master of my own mind, how to be a master in this world, uh, how to be a master in relationships, how to be a master. So it's really the process of mastery that this pursuit of perfection uh, drives. I think what's critical is getting over this fear, right? Uh, and that is that I, I have to, there are certain steps. It's continuous improvement. And you feel yourself. I love the idea of myelination. I never heard that. I'm going to use that a lot now. Yeah. Uh, but you can tell when you, that's where the confidence comes from. There's just a sense, and it must be that you've been there before, right? I mean, you tell me. You have, you have in essence, rewired the brain. And this nice. is not and I'm not saying this lightly and I'm not saying it flippantly and I'm not saying it with in the absence of science. Science tells us that you can myelinate, you can rewire the brain with that, that kind of intensity. Mm -hmm. And uh, this isn't something new. We've, we've known this uh, for a very long time. Even people who have had uh, parts of their brain damaged have been able to recuperate a, 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 a lot of their, uh, their activities. But it takes so much effort, mm. and you must be willing to uh, to to uh, to pay the price. 
um, you know, I'm I'm big on the examples that we set. And I and I just wonder how many people looked at you just walking by, by walking by the flight line and said to themselves, I want to be him one day. And and it must be gratifying to know that in essence, you may see yourself as a highly skilled pilot. But some young woman or boy out there sees you as an archetype and sees you as that person that they would love to strive to become. And maybe they dedicate themselves to study and so forth to, to achieve it. Never forget that. And, well, I, and I saw that uh, the, the first time uh, uh, we met. Um, and I'm sure you've influenced uh, many of them. Well, you know, I, I'm so appreciative you bring that up. I, I'd like to break two points is usually we never know the influence we have on somebody, right? It's just what you're saying. It's it's that observation and you don't even know it. Um, I, I would also say that, you know, like for me personally, I'm in this constant thirst for learning, just what we talked about earlier. So I don't see myself as having achieved all that. I see myself as, wow, there's so much more that I can learn. There's so much more like this conversation that I can give to others. Um, it's interesting though, that you mentioned the observation because I do have a slide in one of my presentations where there's a little boy sitting on my knee and uh, I was in the blues flight suit, but I actually got to meet him. That's meet him, and that's what we do: is the blues as we go to the crowd line. Uh, and it turns out, 18 years later, that little boy is a blue angel, right? Wow. So, and and there's a picture uh, of that of him uh, handing it back to me. But that's the oddity. That's the rare one. You know, what about the thousands and thousands of others? who you don't get it. If I'm a teacher, you know, I think teachers like you and I, but teachers in a classroom, you may right. never know the influence that you really have on somebody, but it's so sweet when a student comes back to you at some point and says, hey, Joe, you made an impact on my, my life. I think for me, it's not about that, right? It's about a purpose higher than self. It's about knowing you may never get the feedback back and that's okay. That, um, and that's why the blues take diversity very, very strong, because I want the little girl to see a girl, a woman who, by the way, right now, number four pilot, female, first blue angel, right? Because I and people of color, but we don't we it's everybody. You want to see somebody that what you just said, I'd love to be like that. And I think most of it is that nonverbal communication. You know, it's it's just the presence uh, I got a new book coming out. Glad to be your mindset. It's about purpose, passion, and presence. And we're talking about this presence that you do. I, I can't wait to to read it. I can't wait to share it with people on uh, on social media. Listen, I learned so much from you in in that short presentation that uh, that that you did that day. And I was, you know, you talk about being touched. I was touched that here you are as an outsider and you were able to donate to that foundation to help people in uh, in need you know who does that uh, well people who care does that it, it's you know it's it's like it, you know somebody uh, once asked me you know how are heroes made and i say that's the wrong question is it no, no one's born a hero you become a hero when you care if you care enough you'll sacrifice anything and and that level of care uh unexpected uh as it was where you you were able to uh, uh contribute to that those are the things that we don't think about that those that's the sort of the residue with with working with people and trying to achieve more and uh and and do better i i mentor children well i call them children i mean so they're 14 15 years old and and we have these uh get togethers with their parents over uh, the digital format yeah. and we don't know how they will turn out right. um but they're worth trying. They're they're worth you know because you you just never know and um, and 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 we strive for that. Uh, you know, people say, well, you know, why why you're always reading and doing you know following up on the research so I can share it. <laughs> yes.
Yeah. And, and so your credibility, you know, like Joe, I believe you because I know your background, but when you could back it up with science, like you've done in this, yeah. in this thing, now the people who are questioning can, they can hold on to something. You know, they also talk about the faith, right? Just even faith is the evidence of that unseen. I, I saw that definition once I went, what a powerful definition. The evidence of that unseen. Oh, yeah. How do you put that into all that you know? Listen, faith is one of the most interesting things that is both studied and not studied. What's interesting is, you know, I studied a lot of anthropology. And as we go around the world and we study every group, uh, pre-industrial groups and so forth, the striking thing is around the world, there is always faith in something greater. In Mongolia, it was in the, the faith in the blue sky mm. that it would nourish the plains, uh, all, going all the way back to the time of uh, Genghis Khan. Yes. In uh, Oceania, the Pacific Islands, it was uh, the, the, the various deities and so forth. It was faith in this greater thing. And whether you're a believer or you're not a believer, one thing you can't deny that something that is global must serve a purpose. And that purpose is not for us to define, but it is for us to find. And okay. each of us finds it differently. And there's a difference between finding and defining. Wow. I can't define certain things. Uh, I'm not smart enough. But I've been able to find those instances where it's obvious that something, someone more powerful stepped in and had remarkable effects. And, uh, and I think that's the beauty of, of that higher uh, being, that higher uh, purpose of of having a faith in something that can carry you through the through the worst of times. Listen, I wow. I I've been stabbed, I've been shot, um, I've I've gone through many things. Obviously, nothing like uh, our some of my neighbors who um, were uh, just uh, in the Middle East. But you learn that at some point, neither yourself nor the people working on your leg can help you and that someone else is uh is is there and you have to just yield to that and uh and appreciate it at a minimum wow so profound joe i hadn't planned to go this direction but it's amazing what you just taught me about some things you can't define you need to find them right uh absolutely i love that, I love that. And whether, you know, and, I, and I've been to different parts of the world. I was in, in the interior of Brazil with these pre-industrial uh, natives. And, and they have such a profound uh, love and appreciation for nature and how they treat nature and, and what they perceive as their deities. And uh, you can only find that. You can't define it. I, I have no words to, 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 to define it. You just have to be in that moment and say, wow. Amazing what you've taught us. I'd like to wrap up. You and I could talk forever. We'll have you back on. But uh, I'm thinking about a couple ways of wrapping up. Uh, one, I, you already hit it, but I want to see if there's anything else. Um, you, the way I like to ask the question is, if there are certain uh, mantras, sayings, experiences in your life that you live by, so it's a live with, um, this idea of, of finding versus defining falls into that category uh, with these, these children that you, you mentor. Um, yep. What are some of those lessons that you want to make sure who's ever listening to this maybe takes away? Probably the most powerful lesson I learned, I learned from uh, the great uh, uh, astrophysicist, uh, Carl Sagan, who, who said, we're not who we say we are. We're not even who we think we are. In essence, all we are, is our influence on each other. Mm -hmm. And I look at that every day, whether it's talking to my spouse or my neighbors. 
and try to live by that influence. What kind of influence uh, am I? And um, I have no greater aspiration than to just live my life, to learn every day and, and, and to share. And um, and I think that is a, a very valid um, quote to, 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 to live by. Wow, so glad I asked you that. Um, my last question, uh, reverse around this glad to be here mindset that we've been talking about. You saw it in the movie and we, sh we should unpack more of that movie at another time. But what does glad to be here mean to you personally? How utterly fortunate I am to be where I am at this moment in time, uh, blessed in, uh, in many ways, lucky in many ways, um, that where I am has come through the hard work of my parents, of good teachers, of, of many things, that uh, I'm glad to, to, to be here because I have tried not to waste my time, not to waste that which was given to me, that to be here took effort, uh, but also sometimes a lot of luck. Um, and because a lot of that was handed to me or given to me or exposed uh, to me, I can't afford not to be here and not to disparage that, uh, that opportunity. Wow. Present moment. You know, Joe, uh, thank you. I want to thank you for being here right now with me and everybody. I want to thank you for all the wisdom you you portray. I mean, your latest book called Be Exceptional, I think is the perfect title. Uh, you are exceptional. And uh, we're going to make sure that everybody uh, has access to find you, uh, buy your books, whatever. But the, the more important idea is if someone needs to be in touch with you uh, for maybe a speaking engagement or for a book, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Yeah, uh, real easy, joenavarro.net. Um, or they can follow you and then they can, and they can ah. find me. Listen, it's my pleasure to, to, to have the opportunity to, to, to speak to someone of your dedication and caliber and the energy that you give. Um, you actually lifted me up today. Um, oh. today was a, a tough day for many reasons. Um, and you lifted me up as, uh, as you do with so many other people. So, um, thank you for what you do every day. Thank you, Joe. That influence, you're influencing a lot of people. We're inspiring. And I, I heard a definition to breathe life into means to inspire. So let's both continue to breathe life into so many people. You're a blessing, Joe. Thanks for being on board. Great to be here, John. Glad to be here. See you.